See, one of the ways that we can tell that we have made it is the fact that we start accumulating things. Think about around your house, your apartment right now, and how many things you have gotten over the years. You know, some of those things that you just haven't been able to let go of. Mm -hmm. Seems like our living space is getting smaller and smaller just because we can't help but to buy items that will help improve our life, to make our lives easier. See, the more we think about it, the more these things manifest inside of our living space. And the thing about it, as we accumulate, these items get more and more sophisticated. They get more and more better in their quality. And as we're coming up, as we like to say, we like to think that we have some of the finest things in life. All right. We like to say we have some of the finer things in life. You see, as we accumulate, the quality gets better, which means we're actually spending a little bit more because we don't want to keep running out to the store buying the same thing over and over again, right? We want to make sure these things last. Amen. They last. And once you have arrived, you know, at that final spot is the fact that you know when you spend money, it doesn't really affect you. All right. You can get those finer things in life just because you can. Amen. Right. And we enjoy that. We enjoy making our lives easier, having the things that we want. But there's something going on. All right. See, man seems to be always searching always seeking for something, anything that will help fulfill the yearning that's inside of us. All right. And what we like to do, we like to sometimes, because we can't put our finger right on it, we do what are called temporary fixes. You know, when you're younger, you like to go out and socialize. We like to hit those spots. Y'all know what they're called. We don't have to call them out. But we enjoy doing that. But as you become older, you start to realize that you don't get the same satisfaction out of those things as once you used to. And then you have to find something else that will temporarily satisfy you. What is that yearning? What is that thing that's inside of you that you are trying to fulfill and yet you can't put a name to it? What is that thing that you keep temporarily satisfying. We're, we're allowing the substitutions of life and the materialistic aspects of it to give us satisfaction. But it's only short-lived. It's only short-lived. What is really missing? What is... Oh, hold on, maybe the example will help us. You know, sometimes when you get up in the morning, you just want to have some grits. Right? You, 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 matter of fact, you woke up from a dream that you were eating these fresh, hot, mouth-watering, smelt-in-your-mouth, butter. Come on, y'all. Help me out. <laughs> grits. And I don't even like grits. I'm going to tell you this now. But I know y'all do. So just think about it. Get grits in your mind. And you jump up out of that dream, you run into the kitchen, and then you start looking around only to realize you only got cream of wheat. Right. And you're too lazy to go to the store. And you like, I'm going to, you know what, I'm just going to fix some cream of wheat. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have that same satisfaction as getting to the grits. Oh, God. Mm. And you settle. You settle because you're hungry, and that will get you over until lunch. All right. But this is the same thing that we do about the things that come or, or surround us when it comes to our clothing, the car that we want, that house or apartment, that job, that certain man or woman. We settle for things that we know we shouldn't. My God. See, it goes to that calling that's inside of you. There's something that needs to be filled and we don't know exactly what it is. The question we have to ask ourselves, why is there even a calling in the first place? 
See, if we search the scripture out, it'll tell us that we're lost. That that feeling that we have is we're looking for that connection back to God. That we're looking just to understand when there doesn't seem to be any understanding. That we're looking to make sense of the senseless. And why is that? It's because something is missing. All right. You know, the Bible talks about being broken. It talks about a state of brokenness. Mm. And we can find this in several scriptures. Go with me to Psalms 34 and 18. Psalms 34 and 18. And let's look what God is telling us about this brokenness. Psalms 34 and 18. It tells us, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. Think about that first time you realized who you really were when it came to God and how much you needed him to help you, to help guide you through. Isaiah 57 and 15. Isaiah 57 and 15. The word of God says, For thus says the high and exalted one, who lives forever, whose name is holy, I will dwell on a high and holy place. And also with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the contrite. Do you know there's over 27 verses in the Bible that deals with this broken condition, the lowly of spirit? And see, God, he's talking to someone right now. Knowing the condition and position you're in right now, and you're confused in finding out what's the answer. The reason why we're confused is that there's so many different truths that are being thrust down our throat, and we cannot see God for the trees. But the one thing you do know is that you're tired of being tired. You're sick and tired of finding yourself on this same roller coaster, and you want to get off. You're wondering why and so tired of finding yourself in these bad positions and conditions. It seems like nothing is going your way. And you just want to understand why. Why? See, there's a natural curiosity that's embedded in us that is trying to find out what is that yearning that's inside of us that's driving us. So sometimes we look to relationships to fill this gap. We look to a man or a woman to fill that yearning. And yet we're with them, we're happy, but something is still missing. The call is still there. Hmm. What are these deeper issues that have forced us to realize Nothing that we have done has ever truly satisfied us. See, we have this blind spot when we're blown, when we're born, and we got to figure out how to get to what is calling. But to get to what is calling, we have to understand one thing. Who is God? All right. Why did he create mankind? And why is he the only catalyst for the true help that's out there? Mm -hmm. See, the one thing we know about this being called God is that he keeps expressing love to us. All right. And even when we don't do what we need to do, he allows us to ask for forgiveness and get back on the true path. See, God is blessing us right now because we get to ask and answer some very important questions. What is the calling? What is God? And how do we know the truth when we hear it? 
See, we have been infected with this thing called sin. And although we keep trying to come up with all these other alternative answers to how to deal with sin, the only way we truly can deal with it is to give our lives over to God. Amen. See, there is a cure for the condition, but the problem is we're so used to the substitute, we don't know how to focus in on the cure. See, right now, we're dealing with some situations in our lives and we have become comfortable dealing with the chaos. And God never meant for us to be comfortable inside of the chaos. He never told us to be comfortable with the substitution. Amen. Amen. Hmm. See, that's why our passage today, our passage today gives us such good insight into why we should believe in this being called God. But not only understanding the being called God, but how he puts everything in order. Because if you look in your Bibles right now, you look at verse 50 of Psalms, you'll see that this Psalms was created by a man called Asaph. All right. And you say, well, why is that important? Because God uses man to get his processes out, That's right. to get his commandments out. And what he did with this individual, he said, because of who you are, Asaph, you are perfect to let the world know about me. All right. Let's look at Asaph for a moment. You see, first we find out that he is the chief of the temple musicians. He's the head musician. He is the one that lets everyone else know what they're going to play in order to worship and honor God. See, he was in charge of something really important. That is to bring God's people into worship yes. before God. All right. But that's not it. He wasn't only just a chief musician. He was also a prophet. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, Pastor. I, I don't recall this musician being a prophet. Well, if you turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 25, verses 1 and 2, you'll see that Asaph was a prophet. And not only that, we find that there's many prophets that are under the guidance of Asaph, and he's training them how to be a prophet. Mm. Not only was he the chief musician, but he was also a musical teacher. Right. Look at 1 Chronicles 25 and 6. Drop down in 25 just a little bit more. And you see that he's teaching them in the ways of worshiping and bringing honor to God. Pastor, what does that have to do with me? God has designed us the same way. Part of your yearning is inside of that spiritual gift that he's given you, and you're sitting down on it. See, Asaph was a poet also. He, written, he wrote many of the Psalms. Just flick through it. You'll see his name time and time again. Why? Because God put him in charge to prophesy about the things that he was. The things that we will go through. And Asaph left a legacy through God that we get to enjoy. Y'all do know the book of Psalms is a book of songs. That's right, and they sang the praises about God. That's right. And you're saying, why is that important? Because God values you even singing to him. Yes. Lifting him up. Praising his holy name. And so... Asaph was in charge of bringing God's people before God in glory in song. And he did this to the praise and the honor of God. Now, this particular psalm is called a didactic psalm. psalm. And you say, well, why is that important? Because of what a didactic psalm is. It tells you how in a quiet mode how to speak to God. It teaches us the proper way to live. All right. It gives us the right attitude in which we're supposed to approach our God. Uh -huh. And what he does in this particular Psalms is he walks us into a courtroom with God. <laughs> we are in the heavenly realms inside of this Psalm 
And God is guiding Asaph to walk us through. Oh, no. But don't forget about the rest. We're only dealing with verses 1 through 6. What Asaph was doing was letting the people of Israel know that they're not living right. Oh, no. That they have become formalized in the way that they worship him. And God says, you're not worshiping me from your heart. And Asaph deals with that inside of this song. And he says, quit living the way you're living. Amen, somebody. Right. He could be pointing the finger at us right now. Okay. Asaph writing this song so many years ago, he could be talking to each and every one of us right now. What is wrong with the way that you're living? You're not living for God. Right. Mm. Oh, and see, God wants us to praise and worship him so we can submit to his holy standard. The key to this psalm is in the acknowledgement of who God is. Mm -hmm. Look at how it opens up. It says, the mighty one, God, Lord. Don't y'all see that's the triune God right there? Don't you see the mighty one, God, and Lord, let me, let me tell you who these are in the Hebrew. It's El. That just means mighty one, El. But it's refer reference to God. And then God is Elohim. Come on, y'all. And then the last one is Yahweh, the general name of Yah. It's telling us that in this setting, walking into this courtroom, we have all three gods there. And look at the power that is there. We see that in this courtroom, that God, he is mighty. He is Lord. He is God. And he has the authority to do all the action. All right. He has the ultimate power. And his power is supreme. There's nothing in this setting that is outside of the control of God. Right. Nor is there anything outside of this setting that's created that God didn't create. You say, well, pastor, how can you say that? Look at how it opens up. It says, the mighty one, God, the Lord, has spoken and summoned the earth from the rising of the sun to, the, to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shown. Pastor, what are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to tell you that people that tell you that God is not active you got a problem inside of this passage because each time the sun came up, God was there. Each time it set, God was there. And it wasn't just one of them that was there. It was all three of them that was there. Mm. It says, out of Zion, isn't that God's resting place? Isn't that his home? Isn't that where he did it? Come on, y'all help me. It says, the perfection of beauty. And y'all have to see this in the Hebrew it is saying that everything God has done, he's done it perfectly. Yeah, yeah. See, we can walk back in Genesis, and when he was doing all the creating, everything was created perfectly. Right. Hmm. Thank you. It says God has shown he perfectly let his light out. The reason why we have the sun is because the sun resembles God in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. Think about it just for a moment that how the sun just gives off its light. And you say, well, why is that important? Nothing moves without the creative knowledge and wisdom of God. Right. His creative nature, light drives everything to God. Right. Now think about us here on earth. How do we get the things that we get like food, plants, the wood for homes, all these things come from the creation of God and the power of us to see. See, it represents God and his light, and God's light is perfect. God's light is so perfect that it can shine inside of our lives and show us how broken we are. He can tell you what your weaknesses are, but he won't hold those against you. He says, in your weakness, I am made strong. Uh, mm. yes, Lord. What does that mean to me, Pastor? The question is, what is this scene all about that we're walking into? We always want to make it about us. Uh, 
But God says, no, making it about him. So we walk into this courtroom and we see God in his grace, his majesty, his awesome create, and we see that God is ready to act. All right. It says in verse 3, may our God come and not be silent. Fire devours before him and a storm is violently raging around him. Saints, we've got to break this down to see what it is. God is coming... And God is not going to be silent. Why? Because it's judgment time. Look at how verse 6 ends when it tells us that God is the judge. He's coming and he's judging. And how is he judging? He's judging with fire. And the fire is literally eating everything up before him. Come on, saints, Bible readers. We know when God comes back and says that this world will be no more, that it will be consumed by Somebody right. reads the Bible up in here. And look, it, it tells us that the power of this fire is immense. It's a violently raging all around him. Now think about that. It's violently raging around God. Someone that we can't comprehend in his spiritual form, right? So it's violently raging fire. Well, we Californians know that. We see it all the time, right, on TV? We can see a fire get out of control. Now, what if this fire that we have here is not out of control? Amen. That is violently raging on purpose because of the judgment that has been passed out. All right. Mm. My God. But wait a minute. we got to deal with fire for a little bit. Yeah. We can't let fire go because fire is the way of God. See, oftentimes, we want to equate fire with Satan. But look in your scripture. Look at all the scriptures, and you let me know where Satan possesses fire, and fire is under Satan's control. Hmm. Let's, let's look and see how fire manifests itself inside of the Bible. We, we, we see that when God appeared to Moses, he came in a fiery bush. Matter of fact, it didn't burn up. It just looked like it was on fire. <laughs> Moses couldn't understand that, and his curiosity brought him over to God. All right. Come on, what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying we got to understand that fire, 99% of the time, represents God in the Bible. Right. There are very few passages where it talks about evil but even in that, it's letting you know that it's going to be dealt with later. Yes. And ASAP is taking us to the time that it's going to be dealt with. See, there is a correlation between what we see here in Psalms 50 in the book of Revelation. All right. Don't miss that. Amen. Don't miss that the fact that there's 20 verses that talk about the fire of God. All right. At least 20. Let's look at just a few. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians 3 and 13. And I'm going to just do the second part of that verse where it says, It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person. Y'all see the purpose of fire? All right. It's a holy purpose. Yeah. That's 1 Corinthians 3 and 13, 2 Thessalonians 1 and 7, 2 Thessalonians 1 and 7. Second part, it says, the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in a blazing fire with his powerful angels. Hmm. We talked about Moses in Exodus 19 and 18. What about when God revealed himself, revealed himself to the Israelites? That was Exodus 19 and 18 with Moses. Verses 24 and 17. The Lord looked down like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain. Hmm. And you say, well, why, why is that important? Luke 3 and 16. Luke 3 and 16. Second part. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And here's one. This, this is what I love. I love this one. This one shows how 
God's power is inside of his people. Luke 9 and 54. Luke 9 and 54. Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Hmm. Let me read the whole thing. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? See, what we find about fire is that it has a couple of natures to it that we need to understand. Mm -hmm. That fire represents testing and purity to God. When you're talking about God, the fire test, think about when the Bible talks about gold and when it refines it. It has to pass through the fire. Why? So the impurities can come out of it. Just like in our lesson this morning in Sunday school, we saw that. But it also, it also has the connotation to our own salvation. Pastor, say what? Fire has a connotation to our salvation. Look at Jude verses 7 and 8. Jude 7 and 8. The last part of 7, the beginning of 8, it says, or exhibit as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Yet in the same way, these people also dreaming, defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak abusively to angelic majesty. Mm. Mm. So if we don't act right, mm -hmm. the fire, the eternal fire, will test us. Amen. Mm. See, we got to get back to our passage. Fire is important to God, and fire is a weapon of God. All right. Fire also shows the power of God. Mm -hmm. In this, it lets us know as we leave verse 3 and go into verse 4, it says, He summons the heavens above and the earth to judge his people. First of all, y'all do recognize the power that's in this verse, right? It says that God is summoning the heavens, not heaven one with an S on it, the heavens and the earth. Who but God has the power to do that? He's calling them all together for what reason? To judge his people. Saints, the ones that have been with, with me, you know that we talked about this in Deuteronomy, that God says that the heavens and earth will bear witness against his people. All right. This is the fulfillment of that. God is now telling the heavens and earth to come and tell the story about his people. All right. mm. yeah, and look what he says in verse 5. He says, gather my godly ones to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. We sacrifice, saints, so that we may walk with our God. We die daily to those evil the urgings that we have so that we can walk in the light of God, in the holiness of who he is. We need to see this court setting coming together. And he's calling all his participants together for the final call. We have to see the culmination of this by looking at Psalms chapter 4 and verse 3. Psalms 4 and 3. It reads this way. This is a psalm of David. But you know the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Do y'all see that? In verse 5, in our verse in verse 50, we see, gather my godly ones to me. And in Psalms 4 and 3, we see God has set apart godly. We see this unity of scripture. They're telling us the same thing. So the same way God was dealing with David, he was dealing with Asaph. All right. We see that John in the book of Revelation is validating what we're finding in Psalms 50 in verses 1 through 6. 
we're seeing this eternal courtroom and God is calling his special witnesses. See, we learned that we have a special place inside of the courtroom. We know that we're not the ones being judged and yet we're called there to be witnesses. We're special witnesses because we have a place of honor with God. If y'all were with us this morning, you saw that God calls us into his seat. Jesus calls us to his seat. We are going to be sitting from his seat witnessing what's going on with the judgment. And you're saying, well, why would he do this? This is God. This is his eternal plan that he has for us. Why would we come slouching into the place of holiness when God tells us there's no more tricks? There's no more stunts, no more surprises. There's no more conditions that we have to meet. We are now with him and everything is laid before us. He said, because you believed, you get set aside. You get to become a part of the witnesses in this trial. And you say, well, pastor, what is this all going to because we need to know who God is. Yeah. And we see from this, this psalm that he's in a position of power to help guide what is going to come in the end times. But don't just focus on the end times because God says he's been directing everything since the sun has been rising until it sets. God is a part of everything that's going on. And you're saying, well, what's going on with all this evil that's in the world? Why isn't God addressing it the way we feel he should? Because we're not his God. He's our God. And why can't the men and women that are doing those things be held accountable for what they do? As a matter of fact, scripture tells us that's exactly what's going to happen. They're going to be held accountable, and that's the reason why we're in this eternal courtroom today. That's right. Psalms 50 tells us we're in the courtroom because God is bringing his fire, and he's bringing his judgment on all. On all. What we need to see here is something really unique, too. God is calling us back to him. Hallelujah. He's calling us into our eternal position. Yeah. Mm, why is that important? Because only those that are holy get to be with a holy God. Yeah. Christ died for you and I so that we can be in this eternal courtroom, not getting the judgment of God, but getting the blessings of it. Mm -hmm. Part of that blessing is sitting in the seat with Christ as these judgments are being passed out. So I hope you see, as we are bringing this passage to a close, when God says, and the heavens declare his righteousness. <laughs> Understand what we're saying here. It's not our righteousness. It's not the way we feel it should be. Because he is the creator of all, he's over all, it's about his righteousness and lining everything up according to his will and his eternal plan. That's how we get the last part of the sentence where it says, for, John, for God himself is judge. Mm. See, the witnesses, they, just, they get to recant what they have viewed. The judge is the one that has the final disposition. Come on, y'all. We ain't going to act like we've never been in court or something. Come on now. When the judge lowers the gavel, whatever he said, now he is. Amen. The question in closing is, where are you in the courtroom? Do you know if you're being called by God? Are you hearing the call? 
Do you understand at some point in time there will be a final call? All right. Better yet, the question is, will you answer the call? See, God is waiting for you and he's been waiting for you out of love. It's out of love that we have all this. Thank you. It's nothing that we've done. Right. Our salvation is a gift. Y'all know this, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Amen. There's nothing we could have done about our salvation other than the fact that God loves us. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Will you answer? Will you accept the final things in life that is waiting for you now and in the hereafter? My. See, God is calling us for all eternity for us to take our place with him. And saints, it's to our benefit, to our benefit, that we know who God is and know who we are inside of God. Amen? Amen. 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 Amen.